Hi everyone, um, I'm Aisha. I'm a third year MCHEM student at the University of Central Lancashire. And today I'm presenting water purification by photocatalytic destruction of pollutants. So um, there's lots and lots of chemical um, industrial processes. One of the main ones is producing olive oil. And basically they produce water soluble organic pollutants such as phenols. And that's what we're looking at today, that need removal before the water can be dis discharged. There are lots of technologies available to remove these pollutants such as absorption and filtration. But there are problems associated. The government right now is focusing on you know, making sure that everything is being clean and green. So fair enough, you're removing um, a pollutant, and, but then once you remove that, you need to then, you then create another problem as then you fix one problem and then create another problem because then there's another waste there. Well, the technique that we want to use is we fix a problem and there's no waste left over. So there's no another problem to fill out. So because of this, we, we are using natural clays and we are using them because mainly they're very, very cheap, environmentally benign, they're very specific for reactions, they're very good absorbents, they're very easy to separate and most importantly, they're recyclable. So if you're looking at the structure of a clay mineral, um, they, they're compromised of tetrahedrally coordinated silica units, which are represented with a T, and they alternate with repeating um, metal oxide units. Generally, they are aluminium and magnesium, and they are octahedrally coordinated, and they are represented by an O. So these layers are bonded together by a shared oxygen atom. So the two common arrangements we have is the TOT arrangement and the TO arrangement. The TOT arrangement is the better arrangement because more ions can be exchanged into it. And generally, most catalysis is based on this, which is obviously better because then the reaction goes a lot faster. The clays that we use are in montemurial night clays, so using bentonite, which is in, in, an intact clay, and fuller colour, which is an acid activated clay. So those are the two different clays that we're using when we do our reactions. Okay, so the properties of the clays can be modified. You basically exchange in the ion that you want, we're using iron, and you remove the sodium <laughs> or the calcium ions, um, and then what you do with these, you can basically do reaction, and the reactions that we are looking at as the oxidation reactions, and we're oxidizing aqueous phenol. So that's what we're doing, we're doing an exchange. So what this picture is here is a schematic representation of the many common pathways and conditions for the synthesis of common oxides, iron oxide, and oxyhydroxide. So in the lab, we have synthesized a lot of these clays. So to begin with, you start with iron 2 or iron 3, and then through deprotonization, you get to the iron hydroxy phases. And then through all these different ones, such as rapid oxidation, oxidation, <coughs> dehydration, you get to the iron hydroxy phases. So we've synthesized a lot of these clays. And what we realized is the ones that um, react a lot faster are the ones that are least stable. So we're looking at the ones, that, the ones that are better for the reactions, the clays that we use as a catalyst are the ones that, are, for example, magnetite is one of the main ones. It's not stable, but it does the reaction faster, which is obviously what we want to do. So the work that we have done, um, we've taken out um, like sodium and calcium or aluminium and magnesium, and we have exchanged it with iron instead. So we have <laughs> produced uh, nanoparticulate iron oxides, and they are grown within the clay mineral interlayer legion. So basically we've produced iron 3 or iron 2 and 3 oxides um, and these catalysts are used to destroy phenols through thermal catalysis which is without light and photocatalysis which is with light. So we have phenol and we get to carbon dioxide and clean water, clean drinking water. So thermal processes, the ones without light, are quite slow and this is because you can't promote as many electrons within the different bands while their photocatalytic processes, which are the ones with light, they're a lot faster, there's higher energy light photons that can be absorbed, and therefore, basically, you're promoting more electrons within the different bands. So just a quick picture to show you. So nanoparticles are semiconductors, and the electrons are promoted from the valence band to the conduction band. And um, this happens at the same time, thermally and photochemically, and um, after this, the, the electrons are the conduction band. They migrate to the surface. And when that happens, you get a reduction of iron 3 to iron 3, iron 2, sorry. And that's what we are looking to do. So um, the reactions that we use um, within <coughs> um, our um, oxidation reactions, basically we have iron 2, which has been substituted in. And these create hydroxy radicals from hydrogen peroxide. 
so these radicals here. And um, basically, it's these um, radicals that oxidize the organic compounds, and that's how we get to carbon dioxide and water. So the Fenton reaction is about like, so you go from iron 2 to iron 3. The photofenton reaction, you start with iron 3 and go to iron 2. The reason we use photofenton instead of fenton is because when you do a reaction, it's better to have more iron 2 than iron 3. And if we're moving from iron 3 to iron 2, it's obviously better. With more iron 2, the reaction goes faster. And another reason we use this, if you look at this here, we end up with the same thing, meaning that obviously we're recycling it, we're not making any waste, which is obviously what we're looking to do. So when I do a reaction, I have a test tube filled with the water, which has the phenol in it, which is obviously quite harmful to humans. We add clay as the catalyst, and a little bit of hydrogen peroxide, and we shine light on it. And that's how the reaction goes then. Every so often, we take a sample and measure the quantities. So this, the process at the top is with light, which is the one we have been focusing on. So you start off with phenol, and through the synthesis, you end up with carbon dioxide and water. The structures that have been underlined, such as this one here, are the structures that we have identified throughout the reaction. The ones that haven't been identified, such as orthobenzoquinone, we can't actually identify them. The reaction goes so fast. Even if we tried to, we wouldn't be able to. But these are two schemes that we have come up with. This is the one without light, um, and that's the one with light. And obviously, the one with light is what we're focusing on because the reaction goes faster. OK, so this is just a quick comparison to show you. Um, dark is the one in red, and light is the one with um, in blue, and just showing you how fast it degrades. So obviously with light, the phenol degrades to zero a lot faster. So that means there's no phenol left, which is what we want. So this is a clay that hasn't been exchanged. It's a normal clay where you just buy. And basically what we've realized is phenol, which is the blue line, it does degrade, it goes down, and eventually it does actually get to zero. We have proved this. And then all the intermediates, so the stages that you've seen in between, a lot of them, they all build up and go down, which is what we would expect because obviously when you shine light, they need to build up and go down. And the two um, products, before we get to carbon dioxide and water, they're very low quantities and stay um, quite low, which is what we'd expect. So then what we did is we, um, just this is something that we tried on the side. Instead of using hydrogen peroxide, we thought let's use air instead. It would make the process more greener. And if you think about this now, um, evaporation has not been taken into account. So basically, um, if you look at phenol, it is going down. It may not be going down in a curve, which is what we would like, but it is going down. So if you think about it, this is very promising because even though the concentration should be going up because evaporation is happening, it's still going down. This is something we haven't perfected that we are still looking into. But the fact that it's going down when it should be going up, it, it's amazing because this is something that we wouldn't have expected. Um, you don't see many of the intermediates in this graph, and that's because the oxidizing power <coughs> It's too strong, so we wouldn't be able to detect them. We have tried, though. So then um, we exchanged the clay. When I took this over, it was taking like two to three weeks to degrade the phenol to zero. And then we've got it to 350 minutes. And now within 20 minutes, the concentration is very, very small. This is a reaction without light and with, and with an exchange clay that I synthesized myself. So I've made the clay instead of buying it. And the reaction is going so fast, it happens within 20 minutes, that the fact that intermediates, they don't have time to build and go down. They literally just go down straight away to zero. And um, again, we still have the same problem that these intermediates are never go to zero. But these are, have proven to go to zero. So then what we thought we'd do after that was let's do a reaction with light. So this is one about light with another clay that I've synthesized myself. Okay. And then because um, the reaction went really fast last time, I didn't expect it to go that fast. So I only took samples every 20 minutes. So I thought this time I better take it maybe five minutes or something like that. So literally like within five minutes, it's it's not, it has not gone as fast, but it has within, last time it was 20 minutes and it was up to here, so this time it's in within 10 minutes. So within 10 minutes, my phenol has gone down, and it does go down with um, more time. And the intermediates, again, they don't have time to build up and go down because the reaction is that fast. And the two products, before we get to carbon dioxide and water, um, they're still present. We can't actually get them to zero. Those are only <coughs> products that we can't get to zero. Okay, so just to quickly conclude, we've developed many nanocomposites um, with different ratios of clay mineral iron oxides. They are very effective in degrading, uh, degrading phenol by all the intermediates, hydroquinone, catechol, parabenzoquinone, and malic acid and oxalic acid, and we have proven that it does go to carbon dioxide and clean drinking water. So um, I'm looking at phenol. 
um, there are other people within the group that are looking at different similar structures and what we realise is the phenol, the structure that I have got is one of the slowest ones. So there are anilines and they happen within 10 minutes, the reaction without an exchange claim. So the time taken to remove the majority of the phenol has been reduced some days from when I took over two years ago. And now I've got it down to like 20 minutes, 10 minutes. Our room temperature was just using visible light, which is really good. Um, the, we still have a few problems the fact that the malic acid and the oxalic acid, they won't, even if we keep adding more clay, keep adding <coughs> more hydrogen peroxide, it doesn't go down to zero. So future work is going to look to remove these. They are less than 1%, which is very small, but we would like to remove them. Um, they are environmentally benign anyway. So another thing we'd like to do with our future work is instead of using the hydrogen peroxide, we'd use air instead. But obviously more research needs to go into that. So currently we use, we're using fuller colour clay and um, obviously it does work for this process but the next thing that we're going to do is look at bentonite clay um, which is obviously going to be a lot better because we can exchange more into it. So this is exchanging one to one, it's one to 2.5 so as you can put more into it. So obviously the reactions are going to go even faster than what we have, well fingers crossed anyway. Um, so I just want to make a few acknowledgements. Thanks Buka to having me here, my supervisor. The master's student I took over, the two PhD students, and um, Tamar the, and all the technical staff, because if you're a chemist, you know, you go in and nothing works, and they make everything work for you. So thanks very much to them. These are my references, and I'll end the question.